I said, hi and welcome to this Murdoch Music Minute about songs for the deaf by queens of the Stone Age. The third album by Queens of the Stone Age, or lovingly abridged Quatza by fans, is bona fide raw rock and roll. But how well does it hold up after all these years? And um, who are those Queens of the Stone Age anyway? Let's find out, and then I'll be back with the review. With the Queens of the Stone Age, one has to begin with the band Caius. Caius were a modern-day stoner rock band from the Californian desert in the late 80s and early 90s. When that band split up, Caius guitarist, the tall ginger Josh Homme, founded a new group, the Queens of the Stone Age. This band project has always had a loose and frequently changing lineup with Homme as frontman and only constant member. His aim is a modernized raw rock and roll sound resulting in a fresh and lively mix of stoner rock, alternative and more classic rock with traces of metal and punk. The band name was already around in the days of Caius as a nickname for the band members. The Queen's first self-titled album was released in 1998, receiving favorable reviews. Soon, former Caius band colleague Nick Oliveri joined as bassist. Other friends of Homi and the circle around Caius appeared on the second Queens of the Stone Age album, Rated R, from 2000, amongst others Mark Lanigan. That album presented an unusual yet powerful blend of stoner rock, alternative rock and some mellow psychedelic as well as mildly experimental excursions. It featured the songs Feel Good Hit of the Summer, a relentless and repetitive garage punk anthem, simply repeating various addictive substances, and The Lost Art of Keeping a Secret, which gained the band a wider exposure in the alternative scene and almost reached the top 20 of the US mainstream rock charts. Rated R has remained an acclaimed modern rock album, but no one could be prepared for the road trip that was to become the Queens of the Stone Age's third album, released in 2002 and featuring a certain Dave Grohl on drums. Okay, um, let me briefly check if I've got, uh, if I'm prepared for today's review here. Uh, let me see, narcotics, beer cans, cheap whiskey, a gun and ammunition. You never know. Condoms, you never know. No roadmap. Right, I think I'm ready for this review. This album is balls to the wall rock music, but also a concept album. Um, it's a very loose concept or thematic frame. A road trip through the Californian desert with the car radio picking up various stations along the way. Accordingly, the first things we hear on the album um, are a car starting and a voice from the car radio. That is, um, unless you don't rewind your CD copy, um, to a point before the first track. Allegedly, there's a hidden track there um, referred to as the real song or the true song for the deaf. Several versions of um, the cover exist, but uh, the most well-known one is the red one. A very minimalist but striking design lending the whole thing um, a bit of an aura of danger. Famous uh, guest musicians joined the band uh, for this album, Mark Lanigan from uh, The Screaming Trees, for instance, and Dave Grohl is on the drums here. And uh, I'll certainly be talking about the, the drumming a little bit later on. 
So we start our California trip with Clone Radio, K-L-O-M. We play the music that sounds more like anyone else than anyone else. Ever come across such a radio station? The music then is anything but generic FM fodder though. The opening track, you think I ain't worth a dollar, but I feel like a millionaire, sets the feel and tone of the album. It is raw, energetic, up-tempo hard rock, deeply steeped in uh, stoner roots, with a dry but biting guitar sound, aggressive bass, punchy and relentless drumming, and, in this case, Nick Oliveri's manic vocals. This is followed by the first single of the album, No One Knows. Like quite a lot uh, of songs on the album, No One Knows had already existed in an early form before the sessions for Songs for the Deaf. This definite version on the album has a very basic, straightforward rock beat that is, however, adorned with increasingly wicked fills by Dave Grohl on the drums. They are absolutely unnecessary uh, for this kind of uh, four-to-the-floor stomper, but elevate the song to a whole different level. Generally, Dave Grohl is a bit of the secret weapon on this album. The song came with a weird video clip introducing Queens of the Stone Age to a wider audience for the first time, and this song really sticks with you. never wanes on this record. The third track is called First It Giveth, another take no prisoners heavy rocker. This is a good example of the sound on this album, always with a sense of danger and aggression, but also with a rock and roll party approach, which I guess is one of the reasons why this rather heavy album was also palatable for a bigger mainstream audience. The album gets into a darker mood here. First it giveth, the final single taken from the album, deals with drug use as a way to gain artistic inspiration or to fuel artistic inspiration, but also as a danger to destroy all inspiration. First it give it, then it take it away First it give it, then it take it away Song for the Dead is next, another brooding, darker track that is sung by Mark Lanigan. A mysterious hypnotic, um, a bit oriental sounding lick is the backbone of this track. Um, the song picks up from time to time with a stoner riff and more excellent drumming. This is one example of the band getting into a heavier mode. <laughs> Song number five, The Sky is Fallen, continues that plodding desert vibe. Uh, it has rather bleak downbeat and a bit apocalyptic lyrics. Meanwhile, we find out that we've been listening to K-O-O-L, Cool, live and direct from the middle of nowhere. 
but stations are switched to all death metal all of the time. This is the starting shot for Six Shooter, a quick and chaotic Nick Oliveri outbreak with passionate screaming and lots of F words. This track also betrays a certain punk attitude you get um, on uh, the earlier Queens of the Stone Age albums. If you like that sort of thing, um, this is a fun track, though my favorite uh, of those remains quick and to the pointless from the Rated R album. We reach the middle of our road trip with Hanging Tree. This is another dark, slightly cryptic song lyrically. It is played in an interesting meter, but also is rather similar to The Sky is Fallen in feel. And just when the listener might start wondering whether the album is losing steam a bit now, along comes Go With The Flow. What is there to say? This is easily one of the coolest and most important rock songs released since the new millennium. It's a pulse-raising classic with its driving and droning fundament that sounds like a stoner rock version of Iggy and the Stooges combined with a catchy vocal melody. Together with its visually striking video clip filled with action and macho eroticism, this really is the perfect soundtrack for gang fights and car chases in the desert. Gonna Leave You, though also a wash with distorted guitars, is in comparison almost something like the straightforward pop ditty of the album. If it wasn't for allusions to trying to break free from a drug habit. Then we have Do It Again, another massive rocker in the typical Queens of the Stone Age style. It also deals with a classic rock and roll subject. Sex. Before we all get too steamy here, let's try to change to a decent radio station coming in on the car radio. But hallelujah, all we get is a radio preacher. Accordingly, the song that blasts next out of the speakers is called God is in the Radio. This is a cool six minute track with a swampy shuffle groove, a bit like an evil version of CZ Top. In fact, it makes you wonder whether it's God or the devil who is in the radio. And there's also nice grinding and fuzzy guitar on this track. The message of the song can be uh, interpreted in various ways. Is it about televangelists and greedy self-proclaimed preachers? Is it about how the media control our opinions and view of the world? Or is the song criticizing the money factory that is mainstream music business and the mainstream music that we constantly hear on the radio? Possibly all of this. This is a really clever track and a highlight of the album's second half. Time to uh, roll down the windows and catch some desert breeze. Another love song conveys surfer vibes and is sung by Nick Oliveri in a more relaxed style. Um, usually he was the man for high energy, 
frantic scream orgies on Queens of the Stone Age albums. And after all, we are talking about a man here who was notorious for appearing on stage stark naked. With twangy guitars and a farfisa organ sound, the song has a certain 1960s aura. And despite being called another love song, the lyrics to this track are not very happy, though. Well, let's dry our tears and drive on. In the meantime, the Car FM has tuned into WOMB, Woom, where a sultry but also quite arrogant DJ introduces us to the title track. Well, sort of. It's only singular here, Song for the Deaf. A mysterious and also heavy track with crunchy bass and guitars. This song is about stubbornness and ignorance and forms an epic as well as punchy finale. But the journey isn't quite over yet. We reach our final destination, allegedly Joshua Tree, which had already been the place of American dreams for U2 in the 1980s. The Mosquito song, however, is not U2. This is a more acoustic hidden track that serves as an afterthought to the dark and exhausting road trip this album is. It is a bleak and pessimistic tune depicting human beings as nothing but food that hasn't died. By the way, the song also mentions the title to the follow-up album, Lullabies to Paralyze. After the massive sound of uh, Song for the Deaf, this outro track serves uh, or comes across like the end credits to a rather bleak and grim spaghetti western. An unusual rock record, that much can be said. There is a bonus track, at least on the CD version I know, Everybody's Gonna Be Happy, a Kings cover. I believe uh, this was not the first time that the Queens turned to this seminal 1960s band. But yeah, officially Songs for the Deaf ends with Mosquito Song. The trip through California's lonely desert can justly be called the breakthrough for the Queens of the Stone Age. Critics loved the updated return of heavy rock and so did the listeners, even in the mainstream. Songs for the Deaf charted in several top 50s and top 20s around the world, making it to number 19 in the USA and even to number 4 in the UK. I'd say it's not an exaggeration to call this album a modern classic. It could have done maybe with one or two tracks less, but uh, such small trifles aside, um, Songs for the Deaf flows extremely well from start to finish. Um, the music is uh, clearly rooted in uh, classic hard rock and stoner metal, but remains concise and catchy. And even though uh, there is a bleakness and darkness shining through on most of the tracks, Songs for the Deaf also is testament to the energy and fun of guitar-based rock and roll. With this album, Homi, I think that's the right pronunciation, um, I've also sometimes heard Hom, but I think it is Homi, or can I just call you Josh by the end of the video? Hmm? Josh? Uh, he, he raised the bar very high for uh, modern rock albums, and um, this one is not an easy one to outclass. All I can recommend is get in the car and join the road trip with the Queens of the Stone Age. It might give you some hallucinations and a headache, but it's absolutely worth it. 
This album is more than its famous and still excellent singles. For some listeners, it might even be uh, the entry point for uh, alternative rock and stoner rock. I think that's it. Time to sober up for my next Murdoch Music Minute. Thank you and bye bye. You're listening to WANT, the High Desert Wonder Valley favorite radio station. It's been a good night.